Bless us now with a heart to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, amen. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. All right. Summer Sermon Series. I can never say it fast like that. So, church, here is the reality, and there is no denying it. You ready? Americans, Americans are lonely. We have the world at our fingertips, right? So much available to us. So many things about our life are so much easier now than they ever could have been before. Generations before ours could never have guessed what things would be like today. And yet, still, many, many of us deal with the stress of loneliness. Now, in recent years, we've said, man, that pandemic, pandemic created a lot of loneliness. And that's true to an extent. Matter of fact, you may remember in the early days when we're trying to figure out as a church, but as communities, like how do we take care of each other? Well, you know, social distancing, not meeting in places like this. And one of the things people said is you can't do that because it's harmful to people. And one of the things that you had to admit is that it's right. It was. It was hard to disconnect people. But loneliness didn't happen as a result of the pandemic. The pandemic, just like many other facets of life, only made it so unavoidable that you had to pay attention. Americans were lonely far before COVID-19. In fact, in 2017, before any of us had, most of us had ever heard of a coronavirus, is a former Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. He called loneliness a public health epidemic, 2017. And part of what he said was, was adding to this was the increasing pace of life, the constantly increasing pace of life, right? We got to go here. We got to go there. We got to go this place. We got to go do this, right? Not just us adults. We've got our kids trained the same way. We got to go here. We got to go here. We're, we're running so much frantically. Even when we're sitting down, what are we still doing up here? Oh, man, I wish he'd be quiet. No, no. You're thinking, oh, I still got to do this tomorrow. As soon as I get to work, I got to work on that. And then I got that honeydew list. And Right? We're constantly, constantly moving. One of the other things that he said contribute to this was technology. We've gotten so good, so efficient with our technology, it's actually hurting us. Right? Because so many parts of life are We've made so efficient and so convenient that I'm going I'm to quote something that I read in an article, that that convenience and that efficiency has edged out the time-consuming messiness of real relationships. Think of it this way. You need to pay a bill? You could remember right now that there's a bill due, right when you're listening to me. And you'd be like, John, I'm going to take out the Bible app. But really, you're going to take out Wells Fargo. And just like this, you can pay a bill. You want Starbucks? Easy. You want Chick-fil-A? Not today. Otherwise, easy. Right? Easy. You want to make friends? You want to deepen relationships? There's no easy button for that. It takes work. And it's messy because people are hard. Friendships and relationships can be messy. So last week we talked about how difficult it can be to make friends. And I think because it's so difficult, a lot of us are like, man, forget people. I'll just do my own thing, right? Do my own thing here or do my own thing that I, that I want to do wherever else. So I read an article that summed up how hard and time consuming making friends can be. That it roughly takes 50 hours if you want to get to know someone. A casual friendship means you need to have in your mind about 50 hours. Now, that's not, okay, we did hour 27, now let's move on to 28. But it's just, it takes about 50 hours for you to be able to come to a point in a relationship where you say, you know what, that's not just somebody I know. That's not just an acquaintance. Yeah, that's a friend of mine. 50 hours. Think how many coffees that is. How many lunches, how many karaoke songs it takes, right? To build that kind of friendship. 
if you want a deeper relationship, and you want to be a close friend, you're looking at 200 hours. Ain't nobody got time for that. And so we don't make time, do we? And so that's part of what makes it so difficult. And because it's so difficult, you have so many people who are withdrawing more and more, and when we withdraw, the only person we have to withdraw to is ourselves. Now, maybe we can fake it on social media, but we've drawn us within ourselves, and what that does is create a deep-rooted loneliness. Again, last week we mentioned many of the health benefits of friendship. I told you friendship could actually help you live longer. Remember that? Well, we can also think of it the other way. It's important to note that there are real and dangerous consequences of loneliness. There's one article that, uh, if you read into this, you're going to come across at some point. It says, the effects of loneliness, isolation, and weak social networks can be compared to if you were to smoke 15 cigarettes every day. Friends, our loneliness is killing us. Some of you know that. Some of you feel that. Most of us, we, we don't realize it. And so we're talking about the art of friendship. We aren't just saying, oh, I want to make good friends. We also got to realize that part of being good friends is being good friends, recognizing what friends need, right? And if we got so many people, upwards of one out of four people who, who express that they have deep, senses of loneliness every day, then this is something we need to pay attention to. So our story today, I think, is helpful. It's a beautiful story, a beautiful story that is, that takes root in deep pain and loneliness. If you know the whole story, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's a short, it's four chapters long. I encourage you to go read it this afternoon. Uh, hopefully your Wi-Fi goes out because of the rain and you'll have something to do so you can read four chapters of Ruth. It goes by pretty quick, amen? It's a great story. And what we know, if we're going to put loneliness on top of a story like this, we know that there are different types of loneliness, and there are also different reasons for loneliness, right? We go through seasons of loneliness, probably all of us at some point in time. But what we see happening in the book of Ruth is that this sense of loneliness is based on tragic life events for Ruth and her family. It first begins when she experiences her and her family a famine. I don't think any of us have ever gone through that. I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about pandemic. You remember the early days of the pandemic? You go to the store and people are going crazy and there's no toilet paper. Imagine that with just basic food necessities. Imagine that there's no water. Like the famine is so severe, the, fa the family had to move, right? So this, this begins for her with famine. The famine is so bad, she loses her husband. Think how difficult that must be. And if that wasn't enough, famine, losing her husband, she lost, lost both sons. It's a traumatic life experience, something that she has now has to figure out what her life looks like. And you kind of see this in her face as she's talking to her daughters-in-law, Orpha and, and Ruth. And of course, Naomi is older, and if you remember in that culture, it's different being an older widow today than it would have been thousands of years ago. Today, you know, we have support systems and, and families. We're going to take care of our widows. We're going to do what we can. The church is charged to take care of our widows. In ancient cultures, if you're a widow, good luck. Naomi knows that that's going to be her life now, and she also knows that if the two daughters-in-law who are younger, if they carry on with her, they're going to have that same life too. So she tells them, just go. Right? And we can sense, if we're paying attention, if we, if we look at what she's saying, we can sense this, this loneliness that she has as she talks to them. She tells them, you know, I don't have the 50 or 200 plus hours to make new friends, to get a new husband, to be able to, to bear you sons so that you can marry Go home. And then she says, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Imagine feeling like 
even God doesn't want to be your friend. That's a loneliness none of us want to experience. But it's something Naomi feels, and it's something that other people see in her. So we know the story. Most of us remember one of the daughter-in-laws goes with her, says, no, where you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people. Great, great sense of compassion and care. So it's Ruth. Ruth goes with Naomi. They go back to Bethlehem. And if you want to have an idea of how bad this has been for Naomi, when the women of Bethlehem see her, the story says, they're like, is that Naomi? And the sense is not, is that Naomi? It's like, is that Naomi? Oh my goodness. What happened to her? This loneliness, the tragedy that she has experienced, not only does she feel it, but everybody can see it as well. Some of us know what that feels like, amen? So for Naomi, loss and disaster cause her loneliness, and death and disaster are real things today that you and I have to deal with. Right? It's often said that when people come back to church, this is kind of insider uh, language, if you ever want to know, uh, in ministry, you say, well, there's often three Ds that bring people back to church, death, divorce, and disaster. Right? Think about 9-11. How many people returned to church? That was death and disaster, wasn't it? A lot of times when families... Uh, get broken. You can say it's amicable all you want, but there's a brokenness that happens, and oftentimes in those moments, somebody says, God, I need to hear from you, right? So we often, we know to respond in these kinds of ways to faith, so we look, but then there's also another reality that I, I want, I think is important for us to realize today about where we are. If we're saying Americans are lonely, we're saying that that's kind of different maybe than, than people in other countries. And even though Divorce and death and disaster, those are sort of natural things that can happen, that can draw us and bring us loneliness. We also realize that we have sort of forged a perfect storm of loneliness. One Harvard report said it this way, that in taking on loneliness means we need to take on another problem, not just a problem, but a deep moral failure. A moral failure that has reverberated destructively through many aspects of American life for decades. Cultural critics and researchers have decried Americans' focus on the self at the expense of attention to others and the common good. The elevation of self-concerns and the demotion of concern for others is one root, not only of loneliness, but of many other problems now in our country, including lack of decency in our public life, tribalism, social media hostility, and the rise of hate groups. Church, you hear me say all the time the biblical reminder that we aren't just the church, we are a family of God. Even Harvard is saying there's something about us being connected that we have neglected as Americans. So then that the church now has a chance to be the light on the hill, to be the witness to what we see God calls us to be. We aren't making this up. As we read in Scripture over and over, we see this sense of family and community, a, a, a unity and purpose and mission that nothing else, no other group in the world has that was given to the body of Christ. And so Ruth and Naomi become awesome examples for us to consider, to reflect on. Don't just read the stories, oh yeah, I got the story. Reflect on like, what it means for, for Naomi to be in that kind of loneliness, to experience that. And remember, she had two daughters, daughters-in-law. Why did one decide to go and why did one stay with her? What was it about Naomi that Ruth would say, I'm not going anywhere? What was it about Ruth that Naomi says, well, I'm going to give you everything I have as well? Reflect on that to see how this is just a beautiful, a wonderful example of what it means to be the kind of friend that God calls us to be. Remember the story, Naomi works for, for Ruth's good, and she eventually marries Boaz, right? Now, not only is that an important part of their story, right? It's kind of a happy ending, um, but when you read scripture, you know it's not just about happy endings, right? It's, they're not trying to wrap it up in a bow. 
what's actually, there's a bigger story happening, story of God happening in, in the story of Ruth, right? Ruth marries Boaz. Later on in the genealogy of Jesus, Boaz and Ruth are both mentioned as part of bringing Jesus to the world. So I'm going to take a small stretch here and tell you that good friends brought Jesus into the world. Good friends were part of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that as you and I seek to become, learn how to be good friends, better friends, in much the same way, we become part of the incarnation of Jesus all over again. We become part of the way the peace of God not only comes to our life, but to the life of others. For Ruth and Naomi, it works out. You remember those women in Bethlehem when they first saw Naomi? They're like, is that Naomi? At the end of the story in chapter 4, they change their tune. They say, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day. Your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons. They've gone from, man, to rejoicing. And for that story, it's because of good friendship. A friendship based on care and and love, and commitment, right? Once her husband dies, Ruth has no responsibility to Naomi anymore. Nor does Naomi have any responsibility to Ruth anymore. But there's something they share that leads to a blessing. And so I'd like for you to consider, like for us to consider how having those good kind of caring friendships like Naomi and Ruth can help us bring the peace of God to the world today, for the gospel of Christ to to reign in our friendships and so so reign in our lives. So I'll tell you, church, be a good friend. Easy enough? Well, kind of. (laughs) How many of you consider yourself to be older? How many of you are older today than you were a few days ago? That's better. So here's what we know. Making friends, making new friends, gets harder as you get older than you were a couple of days ago. And that's not just, you may have thought, oh, I thought that was just me. That is, I mean, survey after survey shows us that that is something that happens. It's observable. It is something that has been seen and studied that as we get older, it becomes more difficult. And some of that has to do with psychological things, but a lot of it's practical as well. Think about when you're younger, right? You're getting ready to go to school and you have school life, school circles. You have a job. So you have job friends and maybe you're a part of other groups like the church or some other groups. And so you have all these different places where you're connected to different people. And often as you get older, well, you retire. So you don't go to work anymore like that, right? You're not in school anymore, right? Maybe you don't go to church as much as you used to. Maybe you stop going to the other groups. And so just practically speaking, the opportunities to make more friends becomes more difficult in and of itself. And so if we're going to continue to do this, it's going to take effort. It's going to take a willingness to put in the 50 hours or the 200 hours or whatever it may be for us to learn how to be good friends. All right, so church, we say that we want to make Kelsey known as a loving church so that... Yes! That is awesome. And so part of being a loving church, Lord help us, is being a good friend. You, You can't go and be a bad friend to somebody, even be a bad acquaintance, even be a bad shopper, or a bad coworker, or a bad neighbor. You can't go be a bad friend and then say, but I'm part of a loving church. Ain't nobody going to believe you. It doesn't work like that. So being good friends is a way we can make our church known as a loving church so God can be known as a loving God. And what Naomi and Ruth, their story teaches us is that being good friends goes a long way 
in making that happen. So I'm going to leave you with two things as a way to bring this home, what we're talking about. Uh, several years ago, I read a tweet from a pastor who's, who put something that her husband sort of goes by and they make it rule as their family. Because, again, Americans are lonely. There's no denying that. But the church has always been called to be a family. The church has always been called to be a, a body, right? There's something wrong with our body when parts of the body are missing. That's our calling. That's not just an illustration. And so who we are and what we are as the body of Christ is supposed to be different. What people experience as the body of Christ is supposed to be different. All that loneliness and all that hatred, all that junk that the world gives to people is supposed to end. When we come, become a part of the body of Christ. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean we don't get on each other's nerves from time to time. Doesn't mean we always get it right. But it does mean we belong here as a family of God. I love when we sing that communion song. We sing it from time to time, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrong. That's the family of God. You think your political party wants you to do that? No. But that's who we are. So anyway, pastor said, her husband, they have three rules of engagement when they go to church because this is part of our calling. They say, an alone person in our gathering is an emergency. If anybody's alone, it's an emergency. What do you do in an emergency? You go find out, make sure everything's okay. Right? So somebody alone, I've told you this before, I think some of you have experienced it. We, as a family, there's five of us, right? Five Fletchers, we go to new churches, right? Whether it's on vacation or any other time we get to go, we go to new, new churches. I'm not the smallest Fletcher. Even me. We go to new churches, and people don't even acknowledge me, as big as I am. You know they saw me, Rudy. <laughs> what about the rest of the four? How do, you, how do you go to a gathering and not even be acknowledged? You think we belong there? So, a person by themselves in an emergency, which means we go. It doesn't mean we go and fix it. No, we go. We go to that person. The second rule, <laughs> some of you are going to love this, friends can wait. One of the joys we have at coming to church, oh, we want to see everybody, that's great. But if there's somebody we don't know, if there's somebody who's alone, I'll get to you in a second, right? You're fixing to go eat anyway. Friends can wait. And then finally, introduce a newcomer to someone else. So, uh, uh, insider language. Um, Rudy and Johnny, can you come real quick? I'm going to show you something. I'm going to teach you a trick. No, not that trick. All right. Uh, right here, Rudy, Johnny. Rudy and Johnny have never met each other, right? Johnny came to church by himself, right? And someone by themselves is what? You can wait. I'll be right back. Hey, how you doing? Hi, I'm Johnny. I'm John. Nice to have you. Nice to have you here, bro. Nice to meet you. That's a good name you got. Yeah, you too. Yeah, oh, it's good. <laughs> are, are you from around here? Or? Oh, my life. Yeah. All your life? Wow. Okay, well, I'm glad, glad you're here today, man. That burnt, that burnt orange, what's that all about, man? That's for Bea. Oh, really? Really? I thought you said you're new here. <laughs> well, we share, share the same birthday. Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. Do uh, you know my friend Rudy here? How you doing? Rudy. I'm Johnny. Still with Johnny. So watch. This is the holy handoff. Right. So Johnny and I, we've been talking and, you know, he burnt orange and everything. And then, you know, Rudy, Rudy, they say whatever. And then guess what John does? Your turn. Your turn. Oh, a round of applause. That was great. Rudy, I thought you were going to sign him up for a committee, man. Come on, you got to. 
a lone person or a gathering is an emergency, friends can wait, introduce a newcomer to somewhere else, someone else. The last thing I'll leave you with is on the back of our program every week. We're going to put that for August. These Bell's missional habits, I gave it to you last week, told you to begin thinking about it. Now it's time for us to kind of start planning. Like, how can we live into some of this in the coming week? Not just as a one-off thing to do, but habits, right? Habits are habitual, and so we keep doing these things. These are ways that we can learn and continue to be good friends. And I'm not telling you we'll get it all right all the time. I'm not telling you to go out and be perfect. I'm not telling you that you have to constantly be doing something. But if these are habits, then what we can do for one another is help. And all this takes time and effort, and it can be really messy because that is relationships. But what we can do, church, is we can be a part of the healing, the loneliness that so many people experience. Not that we can fix their problems or take all their pain away, but we can at least say, for sure, you are not alone, because I'm right here with you. I think the world needs that. Good friends need good friends. So let's be good friends. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Yeah, amen. Thanks be to God.